key with these goals and resolutions. I mean, I love that we have these big, broad ideas of who we want to be and what we want to do better. And I think it's nice to have those high level ideas, but I think we often make the mistake of not bringing it down to a more granular, actionable level where we create these bite sized pieces that are quantifiable and actually sustainable um, in our lives. Um, and, and, and then we actually give people a chance to succeed because otherwise we just set ourselves up for failure and then we get to go see see i can't do that right and uh, it just confirms all that negative self-talk so small specific and measurable repeatable Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. Today, we're going to dive into the topic of New Year's resolutions, why they often don't work, and what you can do to make sure that the health resolutions that you make in 2023 stick. We will also dive into recent negative media coverage around vitamin D3, multivitamins, or whatever news happens to be hitting the media in this day and age. To help tease through all of this noise and give you actionable intel as you move into 2023 with strength. We will also dive into recent negative media coverage around vitamin D3, multivitamins, and more. To tease through the noise and give you actionable intel as you move into 2023 with strength. Ultimately, I am here to help with that journey. I know that this is something that we've covered in the past, specifically around vitamin D3 as well. But ultimately, I need a little support. So to navigate through this conversation today, I'm joined by Dr. Amey Shani. Dr. Amey is a family practitioner and naturopathic doctor who has lectured extensively to physicians, retailers, and consumers throughout the country. Her writings have been featured in many national magazines and newspapers. She also appears regularly on radio, TV, and podcasts like this one, Nutrition Without Compromise. Dr. Amey, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. It's really good to see you. Great to see you too. Now, before we dig into how we create better habits and ultimately achieve New Year's resolutions instead of just create pipe dreams that never actually materialize, I want to hear your story. So I've been practicing naturopathic medicine for, gosh, I think it's going to be 22 years next spring. (laughs) Only well, a little while. I started when I was 12. So, yeah. you know, it's been a, it's been a long journey. Yeah, well, I, um, well. I, actually, I actually had no idea I wanted to do medicine. Um, I did my undergraduate degree in psychology. Hmm. And when I got out of undergrad, I went to Vanderbilt and I got my uh, undergrad in psych. I came out and moved to Portland, Oregon, and I started working um, in some shelters Mm -hmm. with adjudicated youth um, and then eventually uh, got a job working in an inpatient treatment facility for teenage girls. Hmm. So I was about 22, 23 myself, and I was working with 13 to 18 year old girls who were either on their way uh, to hospital Mm-hmm. Or trying to step themselves down towards being back in a ho- in ho- at home in a home, sometimes a foster home. So these were kids who had usually been through some type of terrible abuse, had uh, been engaging with self harm behaviors, and had you know ended up in a, in a place where they needed to be hospitalized, and then were stepped down into this inpatient facility um, where I was. So it was a really challenging time. And what I walked away from that experience thinking after three and a half years was, how is this how people heal? How do we like lock them away and don't allow them to engage in touch, be touched, healthy touch, basically give them some therapy, give them a lot of medication, give them terrible food, don't let them outside. Like it just... (laughs) It did not resonate with me on any level. And I, it left me with the question of how do we heal, which was not something I'd ever really asked myself. And I, 
at the time I thought um, maybe there'll be some kind of holistic counseling master's program I can go into. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I was ahead of my time, actually, because they exist now. Yeah. But back in the early 90s, they did not. And um, it kind of led me down this path towards, I guess, what what I don't love the term, but what I would call alternative medicine. And I was in Powell's bookshop in Portland, Oregon, and I found this big gray book with red letters on it that said alternative medicine. Deepak Chopra wrote the foreword and every chapter was a different modality, hmm. uh, something different than classic allopathic medicine. And one chapter was naturopathic medicine. And I read this chapter and it was like, for me, it was like a light bulb went on. It's like, this is everything. This is the this is the anatomy and the physiology and the and the, the science, mm-hmm. the scientific medical understanding to to help me understand what's going on in that particular person's body. But then it was layered with this very um, multi layered mind body spirit holistic approach to solving that issue, mm-hmm. with the use of yes conventional medical modalities, but nutrition and nutrition. When did nutrition become alternative medicine? Tell me that nutrition. Right. <laughs> Uh, supplements, herbal medicine, you know, all these different modalities layered on top. And I was like, well, well, this is it. This is everything. And so for me, it was less, I want to be a doctor and I want to do medicine and more that I, I, I stumbled upon this idea, you know, this picture of what it could look like to really help people heal. And, you know, I was young enough and naive enough to be like, well, I'll just go do that. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, one of the very few accredited naturopathic schools in the country was in my backyard in Portland, Oregon. I was going to say the Pacific Northwest is really where a lot of that right? activity happens to be. So you were in was. the right spot at the right time. There I was, right place, right time. And uh, and off I went. And I graduated from naturopathic medical school in 2000. Mm-hmm. And I first went and practiced in New York and Connecticut. And then um, came back to California in 2005, and I've been here in Santa Cruz practicing ever since. So for those that are local to Santa Cruz County, you can reach out to Dr. Shani directly. She has a simple website, drshani.com. That's D-R-S-H-U-N-N-E-Y.com. At any rate, I think that you actually touched on a couple of things that I wanted to talk about today. One is terminology. We make something like a New Year's resolution, And it's supposed to be this big giant thing that we're going to achieve in the next year. And often, guess what? By day 17, by the 17th of a given month, we have fallen so hard off that wagon that we are therefore not going to get back up on the horse, so to speak. I'm probably mixing too many analogies here, but we are not on our way to achieving that goal that we aspirationally set out at the end of December, as the ball was dropping, to think, this is the person I'm going to become, and here's how I'm going to do it, and this is my big lefty goal. So why does this type of goal setting not work, and how can we flip that on its head and create something that's better for us? Yeah, it's a great question, because I think there's there's not one of us that has real faith in in the creation of these New Year's resolutions, right? Because <laughs> we all know, we all know it's it's it can feel like this incredible exercise in futility. So, you know, part of what I do every day with patients in my practice is make resolutions and and goals, mm-hmm. right? Um, I also happen to have a fourteen year old, and so part of what we do all the time is talk about goal setting and making goals. And what I've learned over the years is that we if we if we really want to achieve goals if we want to make changes particularly if they're behavioral changes they need to be small they need to be very specific and they need to um you know be be quantifiable um and and we they need to be sustainable in the sense that we can actually you know we can actually repeat them enough mm-hmm. that they become a new behavior some people say tw- it takes 21 days or it takes 3 weeks you know, I, I don't know what the exact number is. That number gets thrown around a lot, but clearly repetition and practice is important. So, you know, people come in, well, um, you know, we've got these test results back, their blood sugar's high, the cholesterol isn't optimal. Well, I don't really want to take anything, so I'm going to eat better and exercise more, and then can we retest, mm-hmm. right? I get that question all the time. Absolutely, I think that's a fantastic idea, but let's get specific about what does eating better 
and exercising more mean. Mm. And so we'll get extremely granular. Mm -hmm. I'm going to eat a salad every day and I'm going to make sure that I'm in increasing the good fats in my diet. Why would I add that to that list? Well, that's be good fats make us feel satisfied and like we've actually had something delicious and it tells our brains that we've eaten enough and we can stop. It's a, sati it's a satiety response. Not to mention that healthy fats are good for us for a bazillion reasons, which we can talk about more. But so, you know, so that, that means I want you to have an avocado every day. I want you to put fresh olive oil on your salad. I want you to have a piece of fish three to four times a week, not once a week. I want, I want it more, right? So I get very specific, small, specific, measurable, because then you can say, did I do it? Did I have a salad every day this week? Yes, I did. No, I did not. It's very mm -hmm. easy. Giving people minutes, great. So the bulk of the data on exercise suggests that we should be having about 150 minutes of exercise a week. I would say that's a low bar, but, but that's a great place to get people up to. So I think that, again, the key with these goals and resolutions I mean, I love that we have these big, broad ideas of who we want to be and what we want to do better. And I think it's nice to have those high level ideas. But I think we often make the mistake of not bringing it down to a more granular, actionable level where we create these bite sized pieces that are quantifiable and actually sustainable um, in our lives. Um, and, and, and then we actually give people a chance to succeed because otherwise we just set ourselves up for failure and then we get to go see see i can't do that right and uh, it just confirms all that negative self-talk so small specific and measurable repeatable so even when it comes to something like meditation somebody might say right. oh i'm going to meditate daily well what does that yeah. look like because if you don't actually get granular on that they're going right. to forget i have exactly. used a mindful minute perspective where every hour I just try to pause for a minute mm -hmm. and breathe and literally not do anything but pay attention to my breath and make sure I'm actually breathing deeply and expelling my air as opposed to holding half of it in my lungs. Yeah. As I am wont to do when I'm dealing with a stressful situation, I will just hold my breath a little bit and then yeah, your shoulders are hiked up. Same thing when I was running marathons. If my shoulders were creeping... I would suddenly start to feel the tension across my shoulders. And right. so being aware of that and choosing to make these more granular, I think is absolutely critical. Yeah. What do they say? You know, smart goals are specific, right? Yeah. Measurable. What is the A yes. in smart? <laughs> Actionable. Actionable. That's right. Repeatable. Repeatable. I'm guessing. I don't know this acronym, but no, it sounds I think great. It is. Yeah. Smart. And then T, uh, smart. The last one T I think is traceable. No. I can include that with show notes. I'm not going to go look it up right notes, now. Yeah. Exactly. Acronyms are great. I think the thing is, is that this kind of stuff isn't sexy, right? It's just, it's much, you know, it's much sexier to have these, you know, I'm, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm just going to become a kinder, you know, more generous patient person this year. I mean, that's like, how? that's what I'm going to become. But how? Yeah, exactly. Right? So I think we have to get past, you know, the Instagrammableness <laughs> of these big pieces and, and really bring it down because then because then you can really you can do it. You can yeah. break it into pieces and achieve yes. one at a time. This is also what you can refer to as incrementalism. Right. Small incremental changes are more lo more likely to stick with time than the big grandiose idea. So if yeah. you break it down, if you have the big idea, if this is overarching the thing I want to achieve this year and then break it down from there, then you can create actionable goals that can actually get you there. Yes. Now, we mentioned smart. We also mentioned fish. And so since this is a subject near and dear to both of our hearts, yes. I want to talk for a moment about fats and about fish. Um, I've you know, had a long history working with fish oil. Many people think, okay, I'm going to eat fish and they go for the tilapia or the cod filet, the fish and chips. That's not what we're talking about here. And I want to share with people why and then get your feedback. The primary reason is that certain fish don't actually have higher levels of omega-3 than omega-6. What do you know, right? Yeah. Like, that's a shocker. But tilapia... All fish are not created equal. Yeah, tilapia's <laughs> levels of omega-6 are, you know, actually a little higher than their omega-3s. <laughs> and so consuming tilapia will not help you get back into balance. And mm -hmm. then something like a cod filet, let's just take a standard cod filet, most of the oil in that fish is actually in its organs. That's why you have cod liver oils out there. If you're mm -hmm. eating the fish meat itself, it's actually very low in omega-3. Great, mm -hmm. great source of protein, low mm -hmm. in omega-3. And then what do people often do with cod? They yeah. 
fry it. They batter and fry it. So now you're getting a truckload of seed oil. That's a lot of omega-6. So you're actually doing something that's worse for your health. And ultimately, it doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. And mm -hmm. so another acronym that is often used is smash fish. So that's sardines, mackerel, anchovies, um, salmon, and herring. So smash. Those five. Now, I would probably personally remove salmon from there because most of that is farmed these days. And mm -hmm. there's problems with sea lice and other environmental impacts that we could dig into deeply, but just kind of throw that out. Um, low on the food chain fish. Preferably not the carnivorous fish because they're not going to bioaccumulate as many toxins and they're going to be highest in omega-3s, EPA, and DHA. But those fish, they get their EPA and DHA for, are worried about consuming fish that many times a week, then you can also supplement. That doesn't replace a healthy diet though, so you have to be going to food first. Have I said anything that you don't agree with? Uh, no, no, <laughs> I, I agree. I agree 100%. I agree 100%. <laughs> One of my, um, when I uh, work with, with women who've got little kids or uh, men too, but uh, I have mostly women in my practice. Um, one of the things, you know, they're always like, what else, what other advice, what other advice can you give? You know, and I'm like, if you can get your kid to eat sardines, you will be doing them the favor of a lifetime because, because like you just said, I mean, that is, is where it's at. If, if you want to try to get these kinds of essential fats from fish, um, you know, you can get them from algae, which we can talk more about. And that's becoming, you know, more and more available and accessible to consumers, which I think is fantastic. But, you know, when it comes to I like this, I haven't I haven't heard the SMASH acronym either. I'm learning all these acronyms today. <laughs> but yeah, the, the you know, if you can if you can do sardines, um, that's wonderful because it's it's inexpensive. It takes two seconds to open it up and throw it on a salad. And it is going to be the highest omega three content. And, and very sustainable from a, of a, from a planetary angle. Well, low on the food chain is best when it comes to those horses. If we're also thinking about trying to get a young one to take omega-3s, yes. I will say that, you know, a lot of the solutions out there are gummies. So you're adding sugar and you might have some fiber in there too, but it's just training the child to like sweet treats over other things. So Agreed. I personally love going to something that isn't sweet for something like a healthy thing. Like, do I have to give them a gummy vitamin in order for them to get the nutrients they need? That's probably not the best solution for their own palate and for their health long term. Yeah, no, I agree. The gummy industry is, you know, it's it's fantastic in certain ways, right? Um, because it certainly is filling a niche that's that's very difficult to fill without it there's lots of children and adults mm -hmm. who don't want to don't want to take pills but to your point um you know supplements are supposed to be supplements they are supposed to be something that is supplementing a healthy diet and especially with kids if we can figure out how to get healthy foods in them that's that's always going to be beneficial but ad adults too it goes it goes without saying so now i'm going to yeah. break here for a minute and share with people uh, a word about the very company that sponsors this podcast, Orla Nutrition. So we actually produce an algae-based omega-3 in the polar lipid form. And I just want to show those that are watching how small these soft gels are, because to that point about not liking to swallow big pills, I'm in that camp. But I will also tell you that my almost eight-year-old now takes one of these every day. And so he actually reminded me this morning as I was getting him ready for camp, because we're just in the Christmas holiday period and everything shut down. He said, Mommy, you didn't give me my Orlo. <laughs> so he pointed it out to me. Love I it. got him his little pill out and he just ate it with his, um, you know, milk that he had along with his egg this morning. And I'm just does like, he bite it? Does he bite it or does he swallow it? No, he doesn't bite it. But it's not an entirely unpleasant experience. I've actually had some parents tell me that they just take the soft gels and they put them in the smoothie and they let their Vitamix blend it up just because they, you know, don't want to deal with the potential for the no and it's yeah. fine. What's also unique about this particular product is it's really, really dark green. And mm -hmm. that's because it comes from a photosynthetically grown algae. You are getting other phyto compounds with that. Um, and, you know, ultimately that all aids in the digestion and absorption of the omegas in there. Um, what we are seeing when we compare our product to fish oil is two, sometimes three times more absorption. So it depends on the form of the fish oil and everything else. But 
um, we're actually midstream and doing a study specifically to demonstrate that. That's um, really wonderful because I mean, you know, I'm a big fish oil fan, as as you know, um, and I've used algae for years as well, usually as something for my vegans, right? Mm -hmm. You know, some people won't take fish oil. But it, you know, it has not escaped me that, um, you know, the sustainability aspect and the contamination aspect and choosing the right fish and, and how much fish costs. And I mean, there's so many other things that make it very difficult for people to get enough fish and the right fish if they're getting enough. And there's just, there's a lot of obstacles there. So it has not escaped me that um, as the industry grows and we can grow algae more sustainably and in a more controlled environment, you know, I, I always kind of guessed that it would eventually take fish oil over. I don't know how long it'll take to do that, but it won't surprise me at all because I think most people like that idea very, very well. Yeah. And I'm so impressed that your eight-year-old swallows a capsule. He does. Yeah. So I taught him to do this after a friend of mine in the natural products industry taught me many, many years ago how to swallow multiple pills at a time because it was something I was never able to do. And he says, okay, your throat actually opens when you put your chin down. So put them in the back of your mouth, put some fluid in your mouth tip your chin down and swallow. And they just go right down. And so I taught my son to swallow his pills this way. And I said, did it go? And he's like, yeah, it's not my mouth anymore. Like a total That's surprise amazing. to him, right? So don't go back, go forward. Don't go back, go forward. Cause it actually opens the throat, which makes sense. You don't, you don't eat and chew and swallow like this. So oh God. I literally got my 14 year old to swallow pills like last year. You're way ahead of me. Good job, mom. Well, I don't I think if I didn't know that trick, I wouldn't have been able to teach him. You know, they're <laughs> small. They're only like 500 milligrams. So it works. Right. So I wanted to get your perspective when it comes to as you're building your New Year's resolutions. As you're trying to stay healthy and strong throughout the year, a lot of people are making resolutions about their health, their immune system, perhaps their stress, being resilient. I mean, what would you say to people about specifically architecting something as a goal that would be attainable, fulfilling, that would potentially even support a more resilient um, lifestyle? And resilience is kind of the name of the game, isn't it? I think... COVID brought the term resilience to the forefront in a, in a different focus. way. Yeah. yeah. Lots of fun words from, from the, you know, pivoting. Yeah. All of that, but yes, um, resilience. And I think that in many ways that that's what many of us are striving for. I, I feel like there's, you know, there's lots of places in the Venn diagram to choose for your new year's resolutions, but Honestly, I think that one of the places that reaps the most benefit for us across all systems of health, across mind, body, and spirit is focusing on the nervous system and the stress response. I feel like in this, and that is directly tied to resilience. Um, and I feel like stress resilience equals immune resilience. Like they're they're, they're the same. Um, and I feel like in this day and age, with the rate at which we go and produce and the amount of time we work and how much we're on and what's expected of us. Um, and as women, you know, the, the incredible expectation of us um, as caregivers um, and, and working, pe you know, people in the workforce at the same time. I, I mean, it's, it's an exceptional load and we say, oh, well, we should meditate or we should, we should, you know, we've got all these things that we think that we should do. So I, so for me, and when I think about, you know, of course, these questions all become personal to an extent, right? So like, what do I think about in the new year? What do I hope for myself in the new year? Um, it's to continue to build on creating more space uh, to be able to come down, res respond, take, take space back so that we can then move into the world to give more. I feel like we, we have to program in more time um, to recover. You know, we can't have resilience without recovery. We, we simply can't. So what does that look like? I mean, obviously there's different things that that looks like for everybody. And there's things that we can give away and things that we can't give away. Um, 
and and those you know that can be a practical conversation too in regards to you know what can i actually let go of i mean a very simple example um i you know personally i have two jobs I actually have more than two jobs, but my two main jobs are doctoring and mothering, right? And so the second half of my day is often involved is chauffeuring, right? I like, I take off my, my stethoscope and I put on my chauffeur hat. And um, what I decided for my birthday was I asked my mother um, if she could pick my son up one night a week from his parkour class, his parkour training session. And she said, of course, I would love to do that. Uh, I do find that a lot people often want to help when they can. And asking for help is not something that I that I do particularly easily. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So I delegated that to her. So, you know, sometimes we can actually do the nuts and bolts of looking at our lives, looking at where things get particularly impacted, where you could actually have a, a moment of downtime for yourself and, and trying to create that. I mean, there is some logistics to this. I would say that sleep is crucial, right? So people come to see me in my practice for a whole host of reasons, but if they're not sleeping, that goes to the top of the list. We must get them sleeping because that is when so much recovery happens. Um, you know, that you is can't when... be resilient if you're exhausted, right? That's right. You're more That's likely right. to get COVID if you're in this constant state of having a stress response. Yes. And I want to share with people a personal experience that relates to this, because for a while I was burning the candle at both ends of point where it's like I was just on edge and it would manifest in a simple way. Like, you know, I, my kids would come into my office and it's after dinner, but I came down here and was just trying to take care of some stuff and they're asking for my attention and I just snap out of them, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, God, that was not the best moment. This is this is manifestation of me spreading myself too thin, committing, overcommitting, doing too many things, and that I'm not able to show up for that also most important job of being a great mom. And I will tell you that I realized I was having a physical response to this stress that reminds me of hitting my funny bone. Mm. And so you know how when you hit your funny bone, it's like it, you feel the nerve frazzle all the way to the ends. I've had this happen before when I sneezed super hard, where I almost feel it in my nerves. Well, it's the same sort of thing where I've realized I had this kind of, ah, almost like my, I could feel my nerves throughout my body just kind of go spaz for a second. Mm. And like that was my indicator that I needed to rebalance my life. I needed to set some boundaries right? Mm -hmm. And and put some clear defining moments into my day where it was like, okay, well, here is the transition between morning mom to work day. And then this is when I'm going to go ahead and take a moment for myself. This is where I was specifically talking about that mindful moment. Because even yeah. just going through a simple exercise for one minute of just breathing and focusing on breath, there has been study after study that shows that concentration improves, that your work productivity can actually go up. So these are not things that should be ignored in my nerves and my body anymore because I implemented some of these simple strategies. My omega-3 supp supplements were not enough to get rid of all that. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do think that there's, I mean, I think that the omega-3 supplements are actually incredibly important for both stress and immune resilience, um, but I think that we've we've got to put other things in place. And you know, you can talk about um, the importance of eating a healthy diet and you know minimizing sugar and alcohol and caffeine and making sure you're very you're heavy on the veggie content. You've got adequate protein throughout the day. You're getting your healthy fats. You know, you can do that. There's not a lot of rocket scientists to the dietary advice that I give people these mm -hmm. days, right? Exercise, super important. I knew, you know, I went through probably 20 years of my life saying exercise is my meditation. It's my antidepressant. It's my everything. And I do still very much rely on exercise, but exercise is not enough either. What I actually have to do is I have to build in that recovery time. Mm -hmm. So I love your your moments in the hour. Something that um, I do, um, I've actually gotten away from it a little bit, I'm realizing as we talk, but we'll, it's something that I will go back to because I always do, is um, I will get up 10 minutes before I have to. Hmm. 10 minutes. And I will do a, a, I will 
get up. I'll wipe the, the cobwebs out. I'll go sit downstairs in the dark. Nobody else is up. And I will just listen to a meditation for five minutes. Hmm. 10 minutes. Like I, I can handle 10 minutes. Tell me I have to get up a half an hour or an hour before. Or no, 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 no. Right. But for, for me, so, so a little bit there. I also, um, I discovered something called, I'm actually not wearing it today, but something called um, an Apollo Neuro, hmm. which is a wearable device. Now I know you happen to know my good friend, um, Dr. Joseph Maroon, <laughs> um, out of the University of Pittsburgh and the um, neurology, de- the neuroscience department there. Um, Joe's an old friend, and Joe actually was was involved with the studying of this device hmm. at the University of Pittsburgh in the neurology department, which has been shown to, um, it sends these little vibrations and beats. It doesn't track you. It's not a biometric device that's tracking you or measuring your heart rate variability or anything like that, but it is actually acting upon you um, with different vibrations and frequencies. And it has seven different modes. There is a sleep mode, but there's like a focus mode and a social and open mode and a recovery mm-hmm. mode. And I'm sorry, but do this to me while I'm in my life. Yes, please. Right. I don't have to stop. Hmm. I mean, in some ways it's ironic, right? Because in some ways it's fueling, um, my behavior patterns that might not be so healthy. It's not annoying to wear it. No. It's soothing. Okay. Soothing. And I'm a little bit like Pavlov's dog with it. Like I, I put it on and I, I actually, my nervous system, I feel it respond. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the, so this is like the third generation of these biometric devices. Now we're not just tracking, but we're actually affecting. You're giving feedback um, essentially. It's not, it yes. sounds like it's almost like a tuning fork in a way, like retuning. A little your- bit. A little yeah. bit or like a sound bowl or listening to. So I see patients all day. I get right in here. And then I go home and everybody wants to talk to me, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk to anybody because I've been talking all day. So I've got my 15 minutes in the car. I put my device on and I put it on the social and open Hmm. uh, mode. And by the time I get home, I am much, I've come down, right? So I'm not suggesting everybody go out and buy an Apollo Neuro. I mean, they're they're lovely. But the, just the point is, is that these added pieces, you know, 10 minutes in the morning, a minute in your hour, uh, you know, a wearable device, having a playlist in your car that you listen to instead of the news, mm-hmm. right? Honestly, we, we're listening to, all you have to do is be a citizen of this earth in 2022 and be stressed out. I mean, there's where do you, there's not even any place to avert your eyes there's 10 tragedies for everybody to look at, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to, yes, we need to know what's going on and we need to do the things that we can to try to make the world a better place. But we also have these precious, beautiful lives that need to be lived. And we have to find the things that allow us to shift, shift back to here, Mm -hmm. right? And so yes, diet, yes, exercise, but, but it's this nervous system input that I think, you know, getting outside in nature can you get near the water? Can you get to some trees? Um, there's actually data that shows that these things calm down our nervous system. And then, of course, you know, we were joking about sleep, but sleep must be prioritized. And if you want to shoot for eight hours of sleep, which is what most people need, I would say seven, eight hours is a sweet spot. You need to have more than eight hours in bed because it's going to take you some time to get up. You're going to get up and pee maybe more than once. If you're a person of a certain age, you're going to have dogs and children and, you know, things like that. So so we need to really prioritize that. We need to step back from our screens ahead of time. These things, again, not really sexy when we talk about New Year's resolutions, but but actually they are really sexy because (laughs) when you when you can bring your nervous system down. When you recover, when you're resilient, then you can actually, you could actually be sexy. And you can be more present. I mean, right. You'd be more present. And whether that's, you know, literally sexy with like libido, because that's a huge issue, which I think is completely drained out of us if we're exhausted and we have no vitality, Mm -hmm. but even just the juiciness for, for, for non-sexual or non-romantic connection, like that juiciness, we lose that um, if, if we don't recover. So all of those things that can get us to that place. And another thing that I I say to women all the time is, you know, again, I love guys too. And I see them in my office. So it's just that I deal with a lot. So what I say to women all the time is, you know, listen, you, you get your butt to the gym, you make sure you've got good food on your table. You, all those things that are important. Here's what's equally important. Pick three activities that make you feel joyful. 
that make you feel nourished when you walk away from them. Pick, if you have them, three relationships or at least one where when you're with that person, you can let down, Mm. be bitchy, you can cry, you can laugh, you can just be yourself and where you walk away feeling more full, right? We all have relationships that drain us. It's part of life. We have things to do and we have relationships that drain us. That's part of how it goes. But if, if we could pick and prioritize activities and relationships that fill us up and then figure out how to put those in, just like you get to the gym, those things pay you back in spades because they make you feel human. They, they connect you in um, and you remember who you are. You know, you want to you want to activities and things that help you remember who you are. So it sounds right. to me like you're also recommending people reinforce their self and yeah. don't forget to put that at the center of what your resolutions might be, because otherwise you might wake up 10 years from now and realize you don't even know who you are anymore. Well, and I think a lot of people, a lot of us do that, don't we? When we get to like 50 and our kids are getting older and we go, wait, what? And well, that's when somebody's marriage might also dissolve because they're now no longer with a partner that they remained connected to over all yeah. those years. Yeah. I mean, that's fantastic advice. Now, so these can seem like really big out there, you know, ideas. So again, I mean, if this is resonating to anybody who's listening to this and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say, okay, if that sounds good, now bring it here. So what are you going to do? Oh man, I love spending time with Leanne and I haven't seen Leanne in six months. I'm going to call Leanne. I'm going to say, you know, what would be, make me really happy is I want to set up a monthly date with you. If we have to do it over Zoom, I'll do it over Zoom. Okay. So I've got Leanne. I'm going to go get one of those Apollo neuro things. Cause it sounds really great. I'm going to get one of those and try it. I'm going to do my, you know, get granular. So love the big sexy idea here and then bring it in here, right to your heart and get really specific. Well, some and people then, may ever, even appreciate getting themselves a gift, whether it be for a specific occasion or not. But yeah. I um, I once got myself a gift to a local spa or float spa here in Santa Cruz called Equilibrium, where you just go into a dark room, um, super salt water, so it's very buoyant and it's warm yeah. and, and just float for up to an hour. And yeah. you're outside of your headspace. It's meditative. It's calming. It's nourishing in, in a way that some of my, the rest of my life may not be just because mom life, yeah. work life, all of those things converging on one. So yeah. I love that. And I, I think that, well, I just appreciate that you've given people, I think, a clear idea of how they could get there. One of the things that I have confronted, and I've also talked <clears throat> about this on the podcast, is you could be trucking along doing all the things that you think are right for you. And then all of a sudden, let's just say there's some negative press out there that says meditation, I don't know, um, not as healthy. You saw this new study that shows that people who meditate die early. And I'm not saying that happened, but we see negative (laughs) press gets a lot of leg. And so um, we recently saw this happen in the case of vitamin D when the vital study, uh, there was a... um, ancillary study from the vital research that showed that vitamin D3 didn't actually improve um, or reduce the likelihood of bone breaks in women who would supplement with vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And so then this piece gets out there and people think, oh, well, I was taking vitamin D because I was worried about osteoporosis. And now, you know, hey, if women are just going to have as many bone breaks supplementing with vitamin D as not, then I'm just going to stop taking all my supplements because I've lost faith in them. And I think that this is a risk for, it's a health risk for people to stop good habits <laughs> if they yeah. are actually in the space of engaging with a good habit. Um, so I'd love your thoughts specifically on how to look at that when you, something might derail you from your current resolution, you think you're on your path, it might be the negative press, or it could be just someone else's opinion about what you're doing. And they're judging it and saying, Oh, well, you don't need to do that. Yeah, there's a little of that out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody has an opinion, right? What do they say about that? I'm not going to say the words, but I, think- no, but I got you. <laughs> I, I see. Yeah. And, and these days, everybody's an expert, right? So, <sighs> so, you know, here's the thing. I think it's great that people are doing studies. 
I think it's great that consumers are more geared into looking at studies, but I think everybody needs to understand that um, studies can be done poorly. Studies can be reported in a very subjective and biased manner. The media loves to take headlines and run in a, either a very negative or a very positive direction, sometimes overly so. So the bottom line is that it's extremely important to really do your do your homework. And I would say that, you know, when it comes to, you know, if you've got questions about statins or you've got questions about hormones or you've got questions about fish oil or vitamin D or whatever it is that's on the chopping block that day, everything I just mentioned has incredibly positive studies and negative studies about it too, right? <laughs> so how is your average person supposed to sort that through? Obviously, in my fantasy, everybody would go to their doctor who would have a, a wonderful integrative perspective and be able to you know, share with them, here's what I think about what these positive studies say, here what I think about the negative studies say, and now let's talk about you and actually what makes the most sense for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in regards to vitamin D, I think that, you know, for me, it's way too premature to stop giving vitamin D to people. Yes, one of the reasons that we give vitamin D is to maintain bone mineral density, which has the effect long term of hopefully preventing um, osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures. But there's also a, a host of reasons why we give vitamin D, which is crucial for a healthy immune response. It's a pro-hormone. It's important for cardiovascular health and, and blood pressure and uh, mood and I mean, and, 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 on and, and on and on and on. And I feel like there's so many good studies that when a negative study comes out, it's important to look at it. It's important to understand it. But I think it would be really throwing the baby out with the bathwater to simply stop taking vitamin D. What I do still see a lot of is people just taking 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 IUs of vitamin D every day. Mm -hmm. I see the same thing with fish oil, right? Right. And too much. They take too much and then they end up with an issue. And often what happens if you consume way over consume vitamin D, you'll end up with kidney stones which are terrible, like yeah. really awful feeling. Or you can get, um, you know, too much buildup of calcium and spots in your body that you don't want it, like your soft right. tissues, exactly. right? Exactly. And and it's it's completely avoidable, right? So if you're working with a doctor who's monitoring your vitamin D, you know, you want your vitamin D to be, best studies show that you max out on your benefit somewhere between 50 and 60. Mm -hmm. You can see where somebody is. The range of normal at your regular lab starts at 30. So people have a vitamin D of 32 or 29. Their doctor goes, oh, that looks pretty good. I would disagree with that, right? But we know pretty specifically that for every um, 10 points, you want to raise your vitamin D, you need about 1,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, so, you know, you can you can do this very systematically. You can keep people in the 50 to 60 range. You can educate them about, hey, here in Santa Cruz, we are not close enough to the sun between September and May to actually make vitamin D in our skin. So you actually may want to take a little more vitamin D in the winter. You can ease up in the summer right and we can talk to them about healthy ways to get it from the sun so you're not getting a sunburn and you know yeah why don't we do that because i mean i've heard all sorts of things from you know naked sunbathing as being one of them um but really just making sure that you have your inner arms and your stomach exposed like that being really key because those areas of your body seem to be more sensitive to production of vitamin D. Is that correct? I, you know, I, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I mean, what I have read and understood is, is simply having a, a large surface area part of your body hmm. exposed mm -hmm. um, for like 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and, you know, doing it before peak sun hours. So be, peak UV hours, right? So like, you know, before 10, after three, something like that at 15 minutes. And it, you know, it could be your, your back, it could be your stomach. I haven't heard that about the particular parts of the body, but I suppose it's definitely possible. And I do, by the way, I do the same thing with omegas with people, right? So I'll test their omega-3 index. If necessary, the ways in which they can improve their omega-3 status with either either algae or fish oil, how to include more fish. Also, what you know, part of what the omega-3 index is look looks like, of course, your listeners probably know this, is the balance between omega-3s and omega-6s in that particular person's diet. 
And of course, there's many things at play that um, we don't fully understand about that, right? So we know that what that person eats is really important, but what we don't understand as well is how their genetics and their microbiome and other things about how they assimilate those fats impact, um, you know, impact the makeup of the cell membranes and the balance between the omega threes and sixes. So um, I find that actually seeing, okay, what, what do your actual blood levels look like? is way better than me just saying everybody should have 2000 milligrams of EPA and DHA combined a day of fish oil, right? Those days are over. We don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then of course, as you said, you know, with the Orlo algae product, you know, you guys are doing studies that are really looking at bioavailability with much smaller milligram doses of EPA and DHA. So clearly it's not just the milligram amount of the EPA and DHA, it's the source, it's the form. And then it's what's going on in that person's body that either um, enhances or maybe even diminishes their ability to assimilate properly. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is actually test and see what we're working with, how we're doing. Right. And that test, that Omega Quant test, um, if you go to omegaquant.com, and I will include a link in show notes too, um, for anybody who is interested in knowing what their Omega-3 index is, you can buy the test for $49. There are tests that are more comprehensive and more expensive on their site that start at like $100. But if you drill down to the specific test, you can actually get it for $49. You can test it at home. You send it in. It's just a little blood spot test. They give you results within six weeks, and they generally show you um, where you compare to other cultures around the world. And I think the minimum level they really want to see you at is about a 5.5. Is that right? Is that what you could shoot for? You know, it depends on the company because the, the different indexes and ratios are a little different from company to company. So the one that I use is a, is a different number. So it must be, it mm. must be related to that particular company. So definitely look at those ranges. You know, you could get confused about, you know, it's, it's not always apples and apples, the different mm. tests you're looking at. So make, make sure, make sure, you know, but also just to mention, um, you know, there's a like Quest Diagnostics mm. has an RBC, red blood cell, omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. Mm. I just throw it in on my regular annual blood oh. work. You could ask your doctor to do it too. I think it's often covered, especially it's going to be covered if you've got any kind of cardiovascular issue or issue with uh, um, blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance or prediabetes or cholesterol. Um, you can usually get those those covered too. But it's so great that for $49, you can get that out of pocket. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just like putting the uh, tools right in people's hands. Like I did not know that Quest Diagnostics offered that. So I may just ask for no. it as part of my panel. And most doctors don't even do it, mm. you know? So, And now with this new vitamin D test, now people can't get their vitamin D levels run anymore. What? Because doctors are just stopping. Medicare immediately changed their rules around covering vitamin D. Oh, really? Wow. See, I didn't know that. So because of this vital study. They just said, nope. I mean, the vital study, it's, you know, sometimes these studies come out and we just roll our eyes because they're so badly done and it'll, and it'll set an herb or a supplement back years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, uh, think about kava, right? People are still so freaked out about kava from a decade ago, a German study, which was retracted. Mm -hmm. Well, the but retractions never get covered. <laughs> It doesn't get covered, right? So everybody, everybody's like, but isn't kava bad for your liver? And even the labels... Um, on kava supplements will recommend not doing it long term or be because of it because of a study that has since been that has since been debunked and retracted. Yeah. So it's like, you know, but the, so all that to say the vital study um, was not terribly done. I just think it needs to be repeated. And we need to remember that there's many reasons that we take vitamin D. Right. And there's just so many factors. There's just so many factors to just say to just throw it out with that study. Well, I and when I when I read the research, I was specifically thinking automatically vitamin C helps to build flexible bones, iron builds strong bones. So if, what right. about the other markers? What right. if they didn't have enough vitamin K2 in their system too? So they, they weren't sending the calcium to the right spots. Like, right. who knows, there could be so many things getting in the way of their optimal bone health that weren't covered in this piece. Yeah, I think we just need more information because we've got so much good information on vitamin D. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like you said, and something comes along and disrupts a healthy habit. It's like when a negative when a negative omega study comes out, you know, I'm always like, okay, but we have tens of thousands of positives. Mm -hmm. So where does this fit into that? Let's look at the big picture. 
Right. Well, yeah. and to your earlier point, absorption is key. You know, I'm yeah. not somebody that goes out there and recommends, oh, you know, take 15 supplements a day. Uh, there, There is a, a situation, too, where we need to understand some people might need more than other people for all sorts of reasons. And so if you get your levels checked, you can actually make an informed decision. Now, right. if you've already started supplementing and you've just started supplementing with an omega-3, then I would recommend keep taking it for a few months and then have your levels checked. Yeah. And, and see if you need more or maybe if you're really screaming good, you could even take less and yeah. ultimately fine tune your regimen for what your body needs. Yeah, my understanding is that for fat-soluble nutrients, which both vitamin D and omegas are, um, you want to give it somewhere around three months, test mm -hmm. your levels, and take about three months of a specific dose to, to get those levels up. And then, just like Karina, you just said, you can either, you can increase or decrease based on that. Well, yeah. It would be nice if you didn't have to take anything. Not. Yeah, data, data, data. I love data. Now, I've recently um, been looking at a company called Viome, who um, is doing comprehensive analysis of your blood, your spit or your saliva, right? And your feces to essentially you see Viome with a V. Yeah, V with a V. Yeah. And they are running their tests for a few hundred dollars and then will create specific supplements just for you. I, yeah. I remain a little skeptical because I just um, think personalized nutrition is um, has got some some way to come still, but yeah. generally speaking, they're coming up from one perspective of what's healthy for you may not be healthy for me. Broccoli, right. as a for instance, is a very healthy food. I eat it and I'm in immense pain and my system shuts down and I get cold sweats and I have to force myself to relieve to get it out by yeah. whatever means necessary as quickly as possible. And that's the sad truth. Now, would I like to be able to consume broccoli? Yes. Yeah. I replace it with other crucifers. Um, but it's just not healthy for me. And one day perhaps yeah. I'll get through that. Yeah, no, I like, and I like that aspect of what Viome is doing and, and the many, many, many companies that are following suit. My beef with Viome is that they, you know, it's a direct to consumer test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they produce, I mean, when they were doing stool only, so that's before they were doing blood and saliva, they were generating a 92 page report. And <laughs> right. So, so they expect so, you to read it and understand it. So <laughs> they expect the patient to read it and understand it. And then, and that's very difficult. And if the patient reads it, um, what they often walk away with is I need these 25 supplements hmm. And I need to follow this diet, which, you know, for some people can be very extreme. So then they often go to bring it to their doctor. If they've got somebody like me who would actually take the time to look at such a thing. And I look at it and I'm like, I don't even understand these metrics. I don't understand exactly what it is that they are measuring to make this supplement recommendation. Mm -hmm. And we end up, we, it, it ends up being very difficult. So my, you know, if the people, if the people from Viome are listening, I would suggest if you're going to do direct to consumer, you need to make it more granular, make it, bring it in, and make it more actionable and understandable for your consumer. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to do high level, this kind of high level testing and recommendations, then you need to approach licensed healthcare providers, teach them what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. And how to properly interpret it for patients. Like it, right now, it's it's just it's just this huge dump of information, which, like you said so astutely, I think is is good at its top level intention, but has such a long way to go, and ends up creating confusion mm -hmm. and leading people to spend tons of money. Um, somebody's got to make a clinical decision. Nobody needs to be taking 25 supplements. I'm sorry. Right. Well, there's another piece to this that I wanted to also share, because if we're talking about trying to test to develop even what your resolutions might be for the year mm -hmm. when it comes to your health, then I don't know that you can even get there through some of these analyses, because 
I'll give a for instance. I took the Everly Well test. I was really curious to see what it would say about broccoli, right? As a for instance, because I haven't like been a able to eat- sensitivity test, like an IgG test. Yeah, but yeah. because I haven't consumed broccoli in years, it says nothing about it. In fact, it says it's fine. But of course, right. I know it's not because if I right. consume it, I get really painfully ill. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether or not I consumed something over the stretch of the last few months would dictate what that result would be. And what I suspect is that the same thing is also true of the Viome testing. Because totally. if you haven't consumed it, so then it's not going to be able to tell you what you should consume or shouldn't consume if you haven't eaten it. Well, and we're talking about we're measuring the microbiome, right? At least with the stool part of the test, mm-hmm. right? We're measuring the microbiome. How often does your microbiome change? I what did you eat? Where did you go, right? Yeah, what, what were did you, you touching touch? all yeah. over yourself? Who were you hugging? <laughs> Who were you pissing? Who's in your house? What medicines did you take? Did you travel? I mean, how is this, you know, I love where it's going. Like, I love the idea of understanding this this microbiome, this vast, complex city we carry around with us everywhere we go and how it affects our health. I love it. We are so not even close to understanding how to properly measure it and optimize it. And we've got like little ideas, but like these, these these kinds of tests, in my humble opinion, are just throwing that fishing rod out way too far for where we're at, we're at right now. Um, And I I agree with you, it's so changeable. And, And so if we're looking for a food allergy, we have to have eaten the food. But there's also food sensitivities and there's food intolerances. And and these are adverse reactions to food that don't actually create antibodies. That's not how they work. They're not um, immune mediated responses. So you could have a food sensitivity to broccoli that will never show up, even if you're eating broccoli, because that is an IgG antibody test, Mm -hmm. right? So like when it comes to like, I want to take a test to find out which foods I can eat. The bad news that I deliver to patients on a regular basis is there is no one test that will tell you that. There are tests that you can take that will give you pieces of that picture, but there is no comprehensive because we don't properly know how to measure food sensitivity, right? And food intolerances are things we can't digest. So lactose intolerance, right? People who have lactose intolerance, they don't have an allergy. They don't have the enzyme that breaks down the lactose. So in order to see that, you have to think enough to go order a blood test for lactase. Mm -hmm. Your milk's not necessarily going to come back as an allergy on your test. So trying to figure out what foods we should eat based on testing is actually very challenging. And I I think the thing that has proven to me time and again that your body knows best is that you react to it. Yeah. And so an elimination diet is really effective. Yep. And you get Gold to the standard. basics, real simple diet, and then see what starts to aggravate you. I've happened to know for a long time that when I consume wheat products or breads, that my if I eat too much of them, not if I eat a little bit, but if I eat too much of them, I'll start to feel disconnected from my stomach. Just like something's not right. It's not talking to the rest of my body so much. Mm-hmm. And so I'll start to limit my grains and suddenly I feel better. And my waistline looks a little smaller and everything because I, I, I'm dealing with the fact that I had too much of something. And it was creating some inflammation in my system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, it, when it comes to broccoli, I can't eat that. I also now can't eat quinoa. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to get to the bottom of this anytime soon. But I ate a lot of quinoa for a while. And I think my body just said, okay, enough. <laughs> Maybe able to come back to it in another day. You know, so much of this really comes back to listening to our, listening to our bodies, right? listening to those wise voices, you know, the ones that tell us it's time, you know, say no, it's time to rest. The Mm -hmm. ones that say, don't eat that, you know, you don't need that glass of wine. You should take a break from your coffee. You know, I mean, these, these, we become so good at not listening to ourselves. I mean, in in fact, the whole world around us is kind of set up to get us to stop listening, Mm -hmm. You know, and we go back to the concept of intuitive eating. We go back to these ideas of, you know, how do we get back? And and to me, we get back when we make time for recovery, right? When we are sleeping well, when we're doing things to manage our stress, when we're making sure we have time with that girlfriend who always just 
we walk out of there feeling like three inches taller, you know, like, like that's when we start to listen to ourselves better and make better choices for ourselves. And, you know, we look to our doctors, we look to our experts, we look online, we look to tests and all these things are really important. I wish that we would also, you know, listen to ourselves too. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to the wisdom of your body and your experience. Yes. Wow. Well, I can't think of a better note on which to end today's conversation. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. May. This is great, Karina. I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, I hope so too. To find out more about Dr. M.A. Shani, drop by our show notes and you can be linked directly to her site, drshani.com. You can also visit orlonutrition.com for our complete blog, including transcripts and features that you won't find anywhere else. If you have questions about what we covered or topics that you'd like us to dive more deeply into, hit us up on social channels at Orlo Nutrition, or you can send me an email note always to hello at orlonutrition.com. As we close today's show, I hope that you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me as I say my closing words. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either or. 